Um, I'm going to cover noise in quantum computing, and the, um, the approach is going to be very similar to uh, what you saw before. So initially, I will do a, an introduction. And after that, we will be playing a little bit with the console so you can see noise in action. And in the with your with your own hands and by doing it by, by yourself. Mm, so yeah, let's let's do that. I'll be helping you along. Vanessa is going to be in the background this time. She's going to be the one answering questions because I'm really bad at multitasking. I'm not like a quantum computer, so I need a, I need help. Um, first of all, let's cover a, a, a few uh, basic concepts. Let me see if I can get my slides sorted sorted here. Uh, let me close this window. Excellent. You should see my full screen at the moment. Great. So in this session, we are going to get to the core of uh, why quantum computing is, is really hard. And, and you will see, as I said, noise impacting your calculations with, with your own eyes. You saw that already when you ran your circuit in, in Rigetti, and you saw that the expected results of all ones and all zeros were not showing up. It was all messed up. So that was, as you very well said, many of you, did, uh, because of noise. So when you hear that word in the normal world, what you probably think is about like loud sounds or the sounds of traffic, things that are makes difficult to hear and things like that. Here we mean something a little bit different. And the noise describes all the things that can cause a quantum for a quantum computer to malfunction. Um, it's the same like or similar analogy in a mobile phone call when when, when it suffers from electronic noise uh, that leads to a to a breakup and you cannot hear well to the other person on the other side of the line. The quantum computer is also susceptible to to noise from from all sorts of sources, also waves. Uh, it can be the electromagnetic field of the of the earth, uh, uh, signals coming from Wi-Fi as well. And even other qubits that are in proximity, you have many qubits that you are trying to put together to build a machine, and the qubits might interfere with each other uh, in ways that you didn't expect. So that also causes causes noise. So <clears throat> when all these qubits are exposed to this kind of noise, the information that they hold get degraded. Um, in the same way that we were describing with the phone call, right? It, it's difficult to to understand or to read what they are trying to say, and this is the what is known as the coherence that Vanessa mentioned earlier as well. So also, when when a qubit is just sitting idle, not being used in a computation, just you initialize the qubit and you leave it there, um, the the states can also be affected by by this decoherence. And obviously, when you start to apply gates, as you saw, the X gate, the C naught gate, and all that, the particle might be rotating the wrong amount. Um, the, the gates that you that you saw consist in, in very often on, on getting this qubit that sometimes it's um, an ion or sometimes it is a, a photon or, or a subatomic particle, and you're trying to rotate it some, somehow. So that's a, a very, very difficult engineering challenge. So sometimes the particle just uh, rotate by the wrong amount and you get the wrong result. So that's another sort of, of noise. In any case, at the end, what happens is that the, the data that, or the information that you were expecting to get gets completely randomized or, or totally erased. And that's not really a good thing when you are trying to to represent information, right? And um, so that's what we care about investigating more about this field um, because we want to understand how noise works in order to prevent it. If you compare a quantum computer with a standard computer that are made of transistors, the, the quantum computers are extremely sensitive to, to the noise. If you think on a traditional computer, the the typical transistor in the microprocessor might run for a billion years at a billion operations per second without ever suffering any hardware fault. However, a quantum computer, uh, the quantum bits can become randomized within a thousandth of a second or sometimes more. It depends on the device. There's a lot of advances being made. Pa papers are being published every week and, and times are improving. But even though uh, the orders of magnitude are there, uh, there's no way uh, to compare one thing with uh, the, a classical computer with a quantum computer in terms of uh, lifespan. So what do we do about this? Uh, there are several things that, that we can do. Um, 
to start, for the past 20 years or so, many people have come up with uh, several algorithms or very smart ways to make the hardware stably, uh, passively more stable and shielding the hardware from noise and the qubits from noise. Um, and at the same time, the theoretical physicists are also designed clever mechanisms uh, called the, the quantum error correction that can identify and fix those errors on the fly in, in the hardware, which is, sounds great, but the downside of that is just to make it work, you have to spread the information about uh, a lot of qubits or a bunch of qubits to make it happen. If you think on traditional computing, it's, it will be like building a cluster, right? Uh, so if you have a failure in one member of the cluster, then the other one can take over and you can reach a quorum. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it is true that uh, you might have to group qubits together in order to get a good logical qubit. And sometimes with a few of them, as you can see in this cartoon picture here, might be enough, but sometimes uh, it might happen that you need um, uh, hundreds of qubits to just uh, get a handful of, of a few good qubits. So the difficulty here is to making a schemes that are fault tolerant uh, or are efficient to implement in this constrained hardware that we are uh, that we have nowadays and, and the devices are not large enough to, to perform full error correction even we know the, the perfect schemes to make it happen. So quantum error correction is, is a topic that I, I really like and I always like to introduce it, but we are not going to be uh, focusing on it right now because we want to talk about, about noise. And to understand noise, we need to understand the circuit model that, that you have been dealing with so far. Let's, let's get a little bit deeper on how we manipulate and measure those qubits. Um, as many of you might know, the Schrodinger equation that, that I put over there, at least one of the expressions of the Schrodinger equation, explains how the particles in, in quantum physics behave. And it says that over time, the total energy uh, has to stay the same. Those are the size on, on both sides of the equation. That's the energy, and it's a function of time that is both as represented as t in both sides of the, of the equation. And we um, express the time evolution of this quantum state with this formula uh, using the uh, what we call unitary operators. Uh, so when we do linear transformations on these operators, we get uh, what we call the unitary transforms, or they are also called the, the quantum logic gates, the gates that you have been seeing today. And those gates are a predefined set, as you can see there on the right-hand side. You have a comprehensive list there. You have been playing already with a few of them, but they are finite. There is only a number of them that you can use. So if that's the case, um, what happens? In the circuit model of computation, uh, this logic gates operates in a qubit or in a couple of qubits. And as you can see in the example, and here, for example, the Haramar gate is, is bringing uh, this, this qubit to uh, superposition of state. And, and then we know that these qubits, are, these gates are the building blocks of quantum circuits. Um, they are like a toolbox uh, to handle these state vectors and, and describe the pure states, the, the 0, 0, and 1, 1 states that we were expecting, for example, in, in this measurement. Uh, however, this this framework is not uh, helping us with uh, other other situations like noise and the coherence and and things like that. When when we are operating with noise, uh, we have the the mixed states. These are states that we we cannot control, and the Schrodinger equation is not a good framework to to represent mathematically those states. It just runs short because there are not unitary operators anymore. So we need that richer representation and that is uh, the density matrix formalism. Uh, that is uh, something that allows us to represent both the pure and, and mixed states and uh, unlike the state vector representation, the density matrix uh, formalism allows us to, to use the same mathematical language that we use with the Schrodinger equation to describe to describe any state, no matter what that is. And it allows for the calculation of the probabilities of the outcome of any measurement performed perform in, a, in a system. Um, OK, so that's that.
So the most general type of operations that you can apply to a quantum system are called the quantum channels, as opposed to the logical gates. So um, the gates, as I've said, are a predefined set, and the channels, however, are more flexible and account for noise when, when you have to, when you don't have a perfect control on the system. So the, the quantum channels uh, mathematically use the, the Krauss decomposition that is uh, is also known as the operator sum representation. And where a quantum channel N, as I, you see in the formula over there, is acting on a density matrix rho uh, that can be decomposed, uh, as you see in the equation, where the K sub i are the Krauss operators that are described in this quantum channel, and the A sub i are the probabilities associated with, with applying K sub i. So basically what we are saying here is that we are going to do um, rotations that are not con reflected by the logical gates, and they are going to be happening with a certain probability, not all the time. And we need to account for that mathematically. So that's the formula that covers um, these mixed states. And don't worry about it. You're going to see this in practice with a few examples, so you will be able to, to see it very intuitively. Um, so Amazon Bracket has a, a simulator for noise, the, the density metric simulator that Vanessa introduced before, that follows this Krauss representation in order for you to create your own noise. Um, but we also have a series of predefined channels, as we are going to see. Just a refresher on those simulators that Vanessa covered earlier. We are going to focus in now on the on the two the two simulators on the side. The local simulator, besides uh, the default option of being a state vector simulator, if you pass it the right parameter, can be a, den a density matrix simulator, so a noise simulator. And it's, it's very convenient for fast prototyping and, and to see how noise affects your system. And then the density matrix simulator is the dedicated one that can uh, run circuits to up to 17 qubits. And you see that is 17 and not like 50 or 34 like the others. It's, it's because the calculations and the matrix multiplications that happen behind the scenes to make the calculations are uh, way more complex. So you need a lot of computational resources to do that. And, and the adv advantage of the simulators is you can parallelize things and uh, run things uh, that are much bigger in a, a fewer time as well. Uh, we are going to see it in action. Um, this is what you are going to play with in just a second. Um, this is what I'm, I'm getting into. It's very easy to to define the, the noise. And with the local simulator that you already had defined in your previous notebook, we can basically create a noise channel. In this case, it's a bit flip. I'm going to explain the different types of noise that we have in a second. But in this example here, in this piece of code, we are seeing that we have a bit flip with a probability of 0 0.01. So that will be 1%, right? And we are applying the, the circuit to the entire circuit. You see there that this is a um, a bell pair uh, using the variable bell in th the same example that Vanessa used before. So we are applying a 10% bit flip noise in the entire circuit. And then when we define our device, uh, we are passing the bracket DM, uh, standing for density matrix, as a parameter, as a flag. And that way, you will be able to simulate noise. And finally, we define our task, and you just were we just run it as you did before. Uh, you are calling the run uh, method, and you specify the number of shots. Everything is the same. Nothing changes. But before, you have added that noise. And as you can see in the results, 10% of the times, we get this uh, 0, 1, 1, 0 that we didn't expect. But this time, this is not coming from a real device, like in the example that you saw with Rigetti before. It's coming from, from us, who are actually generating this noise. So the density metric simulator, uh, however, um, is more powerful and scales linearly with the, all the number of operations and exponentially with the number of, of qubits. So um, if, uh, if you put a, a lot of, of qubits, it will take longer to run. Uh, but it can handle, as I said, at, after, up until uh, 17 qubits. And you have uh, several observables. If you are familiar with the with the terms, you can get the um, uh, sample expectations with just a few shots, or you can get variance and probability as well, if you wish, by setting the right the right parameters. Uh, let's talk about the noise channels that we have. Which, which types of noise we have? These these are the one qubit and two qubit uh, 
types of noise that are available in bracket. They are not the only, uh, it's not the only noise that exists out there, but this is by far the most common one based on space, space noise. Um, I'm not going to cover them all, but I'm going to cover a few of them for you to understand uh, how do they affect your calculations. You heard me mention in the example before the bit flip. Um, that is the, the noise that when you measure in the computational state, the, in the example that you have been doing, the qubit is flipping from zero to one or vice versa with, with some specific probability. So if you think about it, it's the equivalent to apply an X gate because the X gate that, that executes that rotation uh, in which the computational state changes from, from zero to one. So that's what the bit flip does. Then I'm going to grab the amplitude damping. It's the second one that's the most common that it will help you to model a real device. Uh, this is the asymmetric process that happens when the qubit state is one and decays naturally into the state zero. But this is an irreversible process. There is no way that you can apply an X gate and put it back. Uh, so in a quantum computer, the state one could be in a higher energy state than zero. And once this happened, the, it basically decays to the lower energy state. And this is the reason why the lifespan of qubits when they are staying idle uh, is limited. And they try to make them as, as long lived as possible, but uh, Amplitude damping brings the, the qubit to the lower energy state. And finally, the polarizing, uh, which is the other popular one. Uh, in this one, the qubit is losing all the quantum information that contains on it. So what that means is that it's going to decay into um, some incoherent mix of computational states. Uh, it's going to lose the phase. And also, the if it's in superposition, uh, of basis states is gonna is gonna lose that superposition state as well. So maybe you you thought that you had the qubit with a, a perfect superposition and with this type of noise you will lose that. And so a combination of those three things, uh, if we are talking about one qubit type of noise, is what will be affecting mainly um, your your calculations in a in a real device. So probably I should have started with that, right? Where do we want to simulate all this and go into all this trouble? Well, if, if we are able to, to model the real behavior of a quantum computer, number one, we're going to save execution time in the real device if we are paying for that time and we can do it all under a controlled environment. And we are going to be able to understand better how noise work in order to develop these correction schemes that you will be able to apply in a real computer and execute your, your qubits more or your algorithms more effectively. And that's why we care about it. The great feature of the density metric simulator is that you can define your noise model uh, specifying any cross operator that, that you want. So basically, you can get one of these density metrics and build your own and pass it to the, to the simulator. Um, so, so it's very flexible on that on that respect. Um, there are two main ways of applying noise. You are we are going to see them in a second. You can do it bottom up, meaning that um, the noise operations um, will occur in the same way as you will add any other gate. So, the same way that you add an X gate or a Hadamard gate, you will be applying a specific noise type in one qubit. That's, those are those red squares that you see there. In this is example, are the three qubits are selected. But if you want, you could leave uh, two out of the three qubits completely alone and in perfect pure states and, and executing nicely. And you could introduce the noise only in one qubit if you wanted to. So you have the flexibility to, to do that. Um, but you can also the second method use the second method that you see there that is basically uh, apply the the error to the entire circuit, and you can do it uh, in many ways. You can apply the the noise just to the gates. So you can say across the entire circuit, whenever you find um, I don't know a Hadamard gate, add ten percent of polarization noise. So you will leave every other gate alone and every other qubit alone, and only when you find a Hadamard gate, you will be applying that type of noise or you can say let's apply initialization noise all the circuit all the 
um, circuits in at least in, in the devices that are supported by bracket starts with the zero state so when you initialize your your device everything is supposed to be in zero but that's not always perfect sometimes you uh, you get the uh, a different value or the information gets randomized and you end up ending uh, starting your your circuit with a value of one instead of zero uh, so with this type of noise you can simulate that initialization noise also with a certain probability and finally the readout noise which is the opposite i run my entire circuit with no problems no noise at all but when i'm going to read it uh, there is a complicated process on transforming that quantum signal into a digital signal that you can operate. The cabling that gets that takes place in real devices sometimes is staggering, is really, really uh, complex. So in the readout process on reading the information that your, your uh, quantum device is uh, offering you as an output, you might introduce noise as well. And this uh, function in the simulator allows you to simulate that as well. So what does it mean that if you know enough about your device, you are going to be able to basically simulate its behavior really, really well. And we have uh, a little bit more than 10 minutes left. I went through this presentation very fast because I wanted to give you the opportunity to start playing with this. I have a notebook, but I would like you to work by yourself first a little bit and ask questions and help each other. Um, you created a GHZ circuit before uh, with Vanessa, and you, you had a variable that allows you to decide how many qubits each uh, circuit is going to have. So I want you to create a GHZ circuit that has only three qubits, and then you define the density matrix a simulator. The only thing you have to do is to pass the um, uh, bracket dm variable, if you want, to the local simulator that you have right now. Or if you want, you can define your device by using the ARN of the density metric simulator. At this point, you should already know how to get the ARN for a device in the devices page. So go ahead and give it a shot. I'm giving you here the only new code that you need to execute this. But just by executing this, the circuit will not work. You need to have the previous steps done. Make sure that you import the noise library. This line is very important. You can use the same line that you put at the very top of your notebook before and add the word noise here when you do the bracket.circuits import and execute that. So with that, the noise will take effect, all the libraries. Then you can define a noise channel like this, uh, this bit flip for a 10% probabilities, and then you apply it into your GHZ circuit, the second one that you created, into the entire circuit. And after that, you just can copy and paste the same exercise as before, of the counters and the run to see your results. I know I'm not giving you everything done, but I want you to play around a little bit. And I'm gonna give you five minutes or so to see if you can if you can make it by yourself. And I promise that right after that, I will give you a notebook that has everything step by step. But let's see if we can make it. Gonna try to see the chat which is a challenge here in WebEx. So Jorge, Jorge is asking uh, if they can apply noise to the GHC circuit, but he says mm -hmm. apply all of them at the same time. So I'm not sure. Yes, you could. Um, with this noise channel that I'm giving you here, um, you are defining one variable called noise. You could define other variables and then apply all of them at the same time if you wanted to. Or that's for the general noise. Or, or you can use one of these three functions over here and apply it separately as well, but seri serially, serially to the same circuit. But yeah, the answer is yes, you can apply them all. My suggestion would be that you try to apply this one only first and then you create others and append it. A bit flip, um, 
some polarization, some, and so on. Gonna try to get the chat, as I said. Here's the chat window. There are no questions yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have been just commenting on. You are using the same notebook that you were working with, uh, with Vanessa. The only thing you need to do is to go to the very bottom of that circuit. And if you want, you can copy and paste the, the same function that created the GHZ circuit or just change the variable to three qubits and generate a GHC circuit with three qubits. And after that, you can execute the code that you see in the screen to make this work. <laughs> you ruined your, your circuit. Ah, oh, that's too bad. You can always uh, start a, a new notebook with, within the instance. If you see that your whole environment is messed up, uh, you can stop the kernel and restart or you can start a fresh new note notebook and you can copy the parts that are useful from one book to the other uh, what i want you to do is to execute everything that vanessa gave you first making sure that the number of qubits in the ghz circuit is three and after that use this code that you are seeing in the screen to generate some noise and I want to compare the results. I'm gonna start grabbing my, my notebook since we are almost at time. And let me get it from here. What I want you to do uh, today, um, whenever you have time, uh, tomorrow as well, until the next session is to, to compare um, the results of the simulation, the noise simulation, well, those results that you saw in Rigetti, um, there were a lot of qubits, so it was very, very noisy what, what you did before. But if you reduce your circuit in Rigetti to just three qubits um, and execute it in the machine, the results that you see should be very similar to the ones that I'm proposing here with this bit flip uh, and 10% noise. Gonna give you just a minute for that. I'm going to open here. I just share with you a notebook that will give you the solution, but um, you don't need to to use it straight away. You can you can play a little bit. As you can see here, all I did is to create a, a three qubit circuit by changing this variable to three. This is the same as you have already. So when I print it, it's just three qubits. Then you use the local simulator and execute your, your circuit. This is standard. And get the plot to see the nice graphics. And you did the same for Rigetti, right? And you grab this ARN from the device page without changing anything you basically pass to the rigetti dot run the name of the circuit and the shots and then when it was completed you were able to see these results this is for three qubits from a real quantum computer how the results are messed up 
111 and 000 are the main results, but I have this other noise. What I'm doing in this exercise is to try to simulate that. So what we do is, without touching anything else, is adding the noise. What I did is to create, to import the library for noise. Make sure that my qubits is three, even though I haven't changed it, but I do it again here and call my GHC circuit with three qubits. And then I have two ways of calling my device. The local simulator, passing the bracket DM flag, or with the ARN of the density metric simulator. That is all this line. Since this one goes second, this is the one that was used in this example. The device variable takes, takes value here. So I define my noise as bit flip with a probability of 10%. And then I applied in the entire circuit. So that means that every gate and every qubit is going to get a 10% bit flip noise. Awesome. I see people with results already. I love to see that. These are my results. You just see this is not changing. These three lines are the same as you executed before. I haven't done anything differently. The only thing I did was to add noise previously. And then I plot it. And as you can see, this graph, this is a simulator. It's kind of similar to what Rigetti is giving me. Obviously, obviously, I'm just running bit flips at 10% of the times. And this other noise, it might be the polarization, the phasing, initialization noise. I'm not controlling any of that. But in general numbers, I'm more or less simulating the type of noise that a real device gives me. So this is the part where um, you can take it farther. And I suggest this challenge exercise that is also in the notebook. Do it again, create a three qubit circuit. Well, like someone was saying, try to apply different types of noise and not only that one. And uh, try to do it only on one qubit. For example, just to try to apply the polarizing noise only in the Hadamard gate of the first qubit and see you can do that. And then as an even more challenging exercise, and I'm pointing you to the examples uh, uh, folder where you can find inside the bracket features folder, you can find noise models that will allow you to perfectly model a real device using the density matrix simulator, uh, using the right density matrices. There are some examples on that folder where you can see how model is noise to imitate the behavior of a real computer. Um, with that, what I really, really want to ask you uh, is to, oh, my window hanged. That's the worst moment possible. This is the moment where I was about to offer you the, the survey. Uh, you have you have it at the very end of the notebook if you don't mind to use it. That green screen on the bottom of the notebook takes you to a survey that it takes literally, literally 30 seconds to complete. I'm pasting it there on the chat as well. If you don't mind to click on that and spend a few seconds, literally a few seconds, giving us your feedback, we can use that to improve this session, uh, not only for tomorrow, but uh, for the future sessions to make something that is meaningful to you. Uh, we are about time, but you have the platform open for you to play. Don't feel like you have to go. Keep playing with it. It's open. Launch circuits, break things, try other devices. And tomorrow we will be uh, talking about quantum machine learning and hybrid algorithms. And we will be mixing classical algorithms with quantum algorithms. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure that you solidify these concepts in your head.